From Interior Alaska's most trusted news source, this is the Fairbanks Evening News. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. A North Pole man accused of beating his girlfriend was sentenced this afternoon in Fairbanks Superior Court. Trevor McCombie, who originally faced seven charges, including attempted murder and burglary, had pleaded guilty to lesser charges of felony assault late last year. The prosecution alleged McCombie attacked his then-girlfriend on multiple occasions, leaving her with serious injuries to her head, neck, and shoulders. During testimony, a letter penned by the victim outlined the abuse and recounted times of her being strangled to the point of passing out and later waking up in a closet. According to court documents, McCombie had cut the lines to her phones to keep her from calling for help and threatened her with a firearm. Judge Michael McConaughey sentenced McCombie to three years in jail but suspended two of those years. McCombie's family spoke in support of their son at the time of the hearing. It's just hard hearing all these awful things people say and make him sound so bad and he's not that bad on paper. If he was walking down the street and I saw him, I wouldn't think anything of it. Hey, Trevor, I, <clears throat> an, an analogy of football, but sometimes people are drawn off sides and that's exactly what happened again. McCombie has been in prison since 2014, and with this sentence, he will be released as time served, but will remain on probation for a period of five years. The 2015 wildfire season remains at 4.7 million acres burned, which is the same amount recorded a week ago. But that number may increase as we head into the weekend. South Central Alaska received rain, which slowed the growth of wildfires there. With the rain, nearly 7,000 lightning strikes were reported yesterday. Fire crews are watching affected woodland area closely for new fire starts. Firefighters are still protecting structures in the village of Tanana from the Spicer Creek Fire. 30 miles north of Fairbanks, the Aggie Creek Fire had minimal growth throughout the week. Fire officials say dry conditions are expected in the interior over the next four days and people are asked to be extra careful with outside fires. We have had several new starts due to burns, people that are burning burn barrels or unpermitted burns. We've had a, new, a couple new starts yesterday that were as a result of people burning. So I would caution people that if there is no burn ban in the state that's active right now, but still you need to be real careful with your burns, even if they're permitted to make sure you're following the conditions of the permit and protecting the surrounding areas. It's been a few weeks since Fort Wainwright received its incoming garrison commander. Colonel Sean Williams says his transition has been easy thanks to the support from those on post. Colonel Williams says he will keep relations strong with communities surrounding Fort Wainwright. He is filling the shoes of former Garrison Commander Colonel Cape Zemp, who formed cooperative relationships with the Fairbanks North Star Borough, the City of Fairbanks, and the City of North Pole. Williams adds that Fort Wainwright is a very strategic position in the Pacific Theater and that he wants to make sure that position stays on the strong. At this point, I'm still in the phase of, of understanding and uh, gathering um, uh, gathering an understanding of all that this post has to offer and all that it already does for its soldiers, uh, both our, our military families and the, and the outside community. Um, and, you know, I hope to continue those and where, where needed and where we can uh, improve upon those services and quality of life. The University of Alaska Fairbanks is preparing to take control of the High Frequency Active Auroral Program, more commonly known as HARP, next month. The Gokana facility, is, its equipment and land will be transferred from the U.S. Air Force to UAF for research purposes. The site has been used to study the ionosphere, a region of the Earth's upper atmosphere in the past, and will continue to be used for similar assessments. The operating costs of the program will be covered by scientists paying to use the facility, a model that is commonly applied throughout the research community. The university is talking to several interested anchor clients to help sustain a steady payment inflow. UAF Public Information Officer Marmion Grimes says the university plans to combat the stigma of secrecy associated with the program by remaining transparent. Everybody's familiar with sort of the mystique that surrounds HARP, and um, one of the great things that we're looking forward to doing is, is doing more outreach, um, sharing um, with the public the science that's, that's being done there. Um, HARP is going to do legitimate science. It always has done legitimate science, and there's going to be more opportunities, I think, for us to, to share that with the, the public. All right, when we come back, Fairbanks Police have added an unsolved homicides part to their city website. Mm -hmm. Also, Steve Moody is back with Delicious Dish in this week's edition of Backyard Barbecue. Those stories are next. Stay with us. 
Welcome back. At Monday's Fairbanks City Council meeting, Fairbanks Police announced they had added an unsolved homicides database to the city website. Ryan Grimes was there and he has the story. Back then we recognized this. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm, I really applaud our, our chief here, and I'm not just saying that because he's my boss, because he's interested in it. It's awesome. I, 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 and, you know, the mayor, too, that somebody's actually interested in helping us solve these cases. During the Fairbanks City Council meeting, Fairbanks Police Chief Randall Aragon and Detective Peyton Meredith gave a presentation of 14 unsolved homicides in their jurisdiction. Mahogany Davis is being uh, very aggressively investigated at this time. Uh, detective Adams is a detective assigned to that case. Uh, Carl Arndt was killed back in 1986. He was found stabbed to death, as you can see, over the Northward Building. It's just a total whodunit. Nothing really ever came forward back in the 80s. Uh, Edward Savaiguk, I know who killed him. I'll be blunt, honest right now. That case needs to be resubmitted to the district attorney's office, period. Aragon stated the FPD has three detectives working hard to bring the victims to justice. Their time is mostly invested in the recent murder of John Kaverluk Jr., who was shot and killed at the Rock and Rodeo Bar in May of this year. To, to add up the amount of man hours that has been spent on this case in the last two months is astronomical. Aragon says the webpage is meant to call out to people who may know details about the unsolved homicides. However, the presentation was made meant to rally the support of city council members for at least two cold case detectives needed at the Fairbanks Police Department. It doesn't come free. We're looking at about probably around $160,000, you know, when you talk about the fringe and so forth. But that's what we need. We just don't have enough resources to work these cases as we should. There's money there. We're in very, very good financial shape. Um, whether there's the willingness on the part of the council to add those positions, I don't know. I hope they will. And I hope we get some of the families and concerned citizens come out and talk about this when budget time comes. We need dedicated people to work on these cases. I've been pretty blunt with you about which cases are solvable on this list and which ones are going to be pretty tough. And I'll tell you right now, there's some low-hanging fruit on, these, on this list that can be solved, but it takes months of effort. If you have any information about the unsolved homicides listed in the webpage, please call the Fairbanks Police at 907-450-6500. This is Ryan Grimes reporting. Dry turkey is a tough food to swallow, so how do we make it juicier? Well, Steve Moody has the answer in this week's Backyard Barbecue. Hi, this is Steve Moody from Big Daddy's Barbecue. Back with you again for another segment of Backyard Barbecue. Today we're going to show you how to do turkey. Now you want to do your turkey in a brine overnight. Your, your brine should consist of a gallon of water, one cup of salt, one cup of sugar. You can mix that up brown and white uh, and any other spices that you like in it. Now you're going to want to hit this turkey with some olive oil and that'll help it to give it a good golden glaze when it's done. And then hit it with your favorite rub. Try to get a little under the skin there. And you cover over the top of it with some tin foil. That'll keep it from cooking too fast on the top. And about halfway through, you'll pull that off so you can golden up it. And it's ready to slice and serve. Check out all our recipes at webcenter11.com. Brought to you by Big Daddy's Barbecue. Always making us hungry here. Mm hmm. Absolutely. That was yummy. <laughs> All right, well, Joe Cook is up next with sports. He has a story on hand cyclists uh, in Esther for the Alaska Challenge. I don't even know what that is. Mm, hand well, cyclists? you'll find out, sure. Also, a former Natick basketball player could be playing for $1 million. Mm, those stories, stories are more nice. after the break. <laughs> Welcome back, Interior Sports fans. Joe Cook here with your local Thursday sports cast. Interior motorists probably did a double take this morning. Cyclists were on the road, but we're not talking bikes. No, hand cycles. Here's more on the Alaska Challenge. 
That is definitely something you don't see every day on interior highways. 11 hand cyclists took off from the Esther Fire Department at 9 a.m. for stage three of the Alaska Challenge. They will travel from Esther to Nanana for 46.2 miles. The Alaska Challenge is an eight stage hand cycling race dubbed the longest and hardest hand cycle race in the world. These athletes will cycle over 250 miles by hand. The first two stages were in Anchorage, but the interior stage is the first real road race of the challenge. Three-time Paralympian gold medalist Muffy Davis from Salt Lake City, Utah was eager this morning. I respect this state and the terrain you have up here immensely, and I hope it's good to me. Um, there are going to be a lot of hill climbs, so uh, we're just going to all pace ourselves. I think we're all wanting to just go out and have a fun race and you know do our own thing and definitely respect the uh, terrain we have ahead. The final stage is an 18.8 mile steep climb up Hatcher Pass. Andrew Kirka of Palmer and Edwin Jones out of Anchorage are the Alaskans in the race. Kirka is in third place. He has a little home field advantage. Hatcher Pass is right by his house. I'm literally biking home right now. <laughs> so it's it, it feels great. You know, I get to bike around Alaska. I get to see a lot. And I love this place. I love biking. I'm just here to have fun. The fact that it's competitive just is a bonus for me. The leader is Kenny Harriet from Aberdeen, Scotland. He finished stage three in just under two and a half hours. Harriet describes the difference between the interior and his home in Europe. What I've seen, Alaska is beautiful. Uh, only really seen it from the road, uh, but it still looks great. It's similar to Scotland, but way bigger. That's how you experience Alaska, even if it is on a hand site. Hello, Alaska. The next stage is from Nenana to Healy. Joe Cook reporting. And the Alaska Gold Panthers have been really up and down this summer. One of their recent ups was winning back-to-back -back games recently, but last night was a bit of a downer. The Matsu Miners and Gold Panthers met for Game 2 of their three-game series Wednesday night, which was UAF night at Groton Memorial. Alaska had their second lead of the game on a wild pitch to give them a 2-1 lead. But Riley Roberts, he had a night for Alaska going 3-4, for four, and his RBI tied it up at 3 all in the fifth. Scooter Bynum come on down. Matt Sue Miners, though, they answered with four runs in the top of the six to gain separation. Tanner Nishioka went two for four with two runs and an RBI for Matt Sue. Five pitchers allowed only two earned for the Miners. They won the series with a 7 to 3 win. We're a very hot and cold team, and I mean, today we were swinging it well. We just couldn't really produce as many runs as we wanted, but as we end the season, we can maybe get on a little hot streak and finish out strong. Former UAF basketball standout Andrew Kelly is competing in ESPN's The Basketball Tournament. Kelly advanced to the Super 17 with Team 23 out of Arizona, his home state. Kelly, much like his senior year at UAF, is unconscious from the field in three games. Kelly is a perfect 13 for 13 from the field. He scored a tourney high 13 points in the West Regional Final to help Team 23 advance to the Final 17. The former GNAC Defensive Player of the Year has enjoyed an early pro career overseas, playing in Iceland, Mexico, and France. The basketball tournament is a single elimination five on five tournament with a $1 million grand prize. Tons of former college and NBA players are competing. There is a link in this story on WebCenter11.com sports page. Where you can watch Kelly play on Friday, 8.30 a.m. Alaska time. And the Alaska Nanits cross country team released their schedule for the 2015 fall season. First year head coach Nick Crawford and new assistant Shane Kurtzinger will lead the Nanix into five meets. The season opens with Alaska hosting the Moda Health Alaska Invitational. The two day event will be Thursday, September 3rd, and then Saturday, September 5th at the West Ridge Trails. Seattle Pacific and MSUB will be in the Invitational. UAF will run in the prestigious Stanford Invitational on September 26th. October 10th, they will head to Washington for the Western Washington Invitation. The G Night Championships are also hosted by the Vikings, and that's October 24th. Alaska returns 21 runners, 10 for the men's team, 11 for the women. The NCAA regionals are in November in Oregon. For more on the schedule, visit the WebSurn11.com sports page. The Alaska Nanak Faceoff Club and Yusabelli Coal Mine are partnering to provide local golfers a different spin on an upcoming tournament. There will be a $7,000 purse and payouts for the top three finishers in the net and gross standings and in the random draw team division. For the $150 registration, you'll get on-course refreshments, a Nanak hockey hoodie, prizes, chances to win more cash, and a steak dinner at Double Eagle, Re Double Eagle Restaurant following the tournament. Proceeds go to the UAF Hockey Program. The second annual UAF Faceoff Club Usabelli Coal Mine Stroke Play Tournament has a shotgun start at 9 a.m. on Saturday, July 31st at the Fairbanks Golf Club. 
And that's it for sports tonight. Stay tuned for your full weather forecast. That's after the break and we'll catch you next time. Welcome back to your weather outlook for today. Let's get right to it. Looking at our almanac, as you can see right there, our recent highs and recent lows. Record high was set in 1940, 89 degrees. Record low 52 in 1959. Sun rose today this morning at 4.03 a.m. and it will set at 11.50, giving us daylight of 19 hours, 47 minutes. That's another loss of five minutes over the previous day. And the winds are out of the east. Let's go ahead and take a look at the satellite map. And as you can see, splotchiness everywhere. That usually means moisture when you're looking at the satellite and radar imagery, especially right around in the panhandle. You see that circular motion going in. It's affecting also into the Anchorage Bowl area and then dipping back out into the ocean before twirling right back up into the panhandle. That's going to continue over the next day or so as we take a look at the temperatures around the state for today. Lovely in Fairbanks this time of year, isn't it? Fort Yukon as well. Barrel 40 degrees. Uh, the Gnome even getting in some uh, 57 degree action. That's pretty nice. As you can see that storm front making its uh, westerly approach downward to the south near Cold Bay. Uh, just miserable conditions right there out there right now and also affecting the panhandle as I said before. Take a look at that. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look down at the lower 48. Beautiful except for in Minneapolis. Of course, they're getting right. I lived in Minneapolis for three years, and this is the time of year where they actually those, uh, those storm systems set off in the, in the PM and uh, make for some good boomers all across that area. But that's happening to them as well. Uh, storm systems also affecting the Pacific Northwest. Other than that, looking pretty fairly good for the rest of the country. Phoenix checking in at 105 today, a little cooler, believe it or not, from the day before. And Dallas almost getting up into the 100 degree category. Let's go ahead and go set this in motion, shall we? So there's those storm systems just percolating off to the west and then also affecting down in the south, uh, southeast near Georgia and Miami or Florida as well. But uh, nothing too severe. Taking a look at the forecast for this weekend, high pressure system is going to bring some hot uh, conditions to the northern states. Heat wave down through the Plain States to Texas and again, drenching thunderstorms affecting the Gulf states. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at tomorrow's forecast starting up north here in Alaska. Clouds and fog for Barrow, isolated showers for Nome, and sunny for Fort Yukon. Nome may see some rain there. In the interior, well, Fairbanks 75, but Healy and Delta 68 degrees, 70 degrees, but they're also uh, looking at thunderstorms possibly for them as well, so we'll keep an eye out for that. On the panhandle, take a look. More wetness, Juneau 57 degrees, Ketchikan 61, and in the southwest, they're also being affected by that storm system. So rain is likely for Cold Bay, scattered showers for Kodiak and Bethel temperatures in the 50s for them. Real quickly, we'll take a look at South Central and more wetness <laughs> to the south. Anchorage 68 degrees and Homer 62, Valdez 67 degrees as well. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at our short range forecast for tonight. Isolated thunderstorms possible this evening into the overnight. Tomorrow afternoon, isolated thunderstorms possible. Uh, as well. And so we'll go ahead and take a look at the extended look. Temperature is still looking nice for the weekend. Temperature is near the 80 degree mark and then cooling off as we enter into the work week next week. Lows in the 50s. Wow. Oh, yeah, that's good. Not too bad. Not, Not too bad. No. Yeah. Did you it's have any rain rainy. last night at your softball game? No, we no? didn't have any rain. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was how's beautiful your, today too. How's your ankle holding up? My ankle is holding up well. <laughs> that's I, right. I didn't know injuries. about it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Okay, that will wrap up this edition of the Fairbanks Evening News. We are glad you could join us. All right, well, tonight on NBC Nightly News, two people have been killed and eight injured in a Louisiana theater shooting that's coming up next with Lester Holt. You could join us here six days a week at 6 and 11 or online anytime at webcenter11.com. All right, from all of us here at the News Center, have a great night.